Father in heaven, Lord, we want to thank you so much for this opportunity to be in your presence today. We thank you, O oh God, for every mountain that you brought us over and every valley that you brought us through. But Lord, we thank you even more for just being God. And so, Lord, we turn our hearts to you today, looking to hear a word from you. Lord, I pray that you will guide our hearts into a deeper relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. For several years, a woman had been having trouble sleeping at night because she was worried that One night, a burglar would break in the house while she was sleeping. And this went on for years. You know, every night, she would worry her husband half to death before she went to bed because every sound that she heard, she just knew for sure that it was a burglar in the house. But one night, she went to bed, and while they were sleeping, the husband actually heard a sound in the house. Heard a sound downstairs, and so he went downstairs to investigate, and to his surprise, a burglar was breaking into their house. Now, he does something unexpectedly. He actually says to the burglar, he says, good evening. He says, boy, am I glad to see you. My wife has been waiting to meet you for the last 10 years. Let's go upstairs so you can see her. (laughs) It is so interesting. It's so easy. You know, none of us are really untouched by worry. Worry is such a a pervasive thing in our society today. So many people are filled with anxiety. They even said that the Harvard um, Political um, Review actually did a research where they studied um, young adults between the ages of 18 and 29 to see what were the things that they were most worried about. And what they discovered in that age group is that many of them were worried about, the thing they were worried about the most was if they would get a job when they got out of college. Now, those who were in college, or I mean those who had a job, what they were worried about was whether or not they would still be able to keep their jobs. But they applied the same research in London, to the same to in, the, in London, to a group of young adults in the same age group, and what they discovered, what those young adults were most worried about, was about finances, even more than finding a love interest or their soulmate. That's how worried they were about their finances. We also see in our culture the devastating nature of worry. If you remember. In 2009, German billionaire Adolf Merkel, 74 years old, a billionaire, when his company fell into financial ruin because of the global economic crisis that was taking place, he calmly took off, put on his coat at his home, and walked a few miles and lay down on a train track and allowed and committed suicide by allowing a train to run him over. All because he was worried. Now, they say that he had really only lost about $400 million at the time, you know, only. But think about it, he was worth over $6 billion. <laughs> but yet, the loss of $400 million was so devastating, probably he was worried about what else he might lose. It was so much for him that even though he was 74 years old, he couldn't take it anymore. He took his own life. Today, what I want to talk about today from the Word of God, I want to talk about how misplaced pursuits and how misplaced priorities, how they bring worry to the life of the Christian, how they not only bring worry, but how they have a diminishing effect on our faith in God and our confidence in Him. But not only do our misplaced pursuits and our misplaced priorities affect us in those ways, but our, but our wrongful pursuits and priorities, ultimately, they obscure 
from our view what matters the most. Jesus Christ and his righteousness. Hmm? And so today, I want to talk to you, sermon entitled, Simple Life, No More Worries. Or no worries. Hmm? That's what I put in the bulletin, right? All right. Let's go to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. And I want to start in verse 25. Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 25. And I want to read from the New King James Version of the Bible. And I want to read in your hearing verses 25 to 34. Here's what the Word of God says. Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 25. I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. It says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put in, what, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Hmm? So much here. <laughs> Jesus is talking to a group of people who are well acquainted, quite familiar with what it means to struggle, struggle daily to make ends meet. They are people who know what it means to, to have to wake up every morning worried about how they're going to provide for their needs for that specific day. And I want us to understand that something that in that time it was particularly challenging because most people in that culture, in the audience that Jesus is speaking to, most of them really just have the bare necessities of life. They just have food and shelter and they only have food enough for each day. So every day they wake up in the morning, they have to be wondering how they're going to make ends meet. Not just how they're going to make ends meet, how they're going to pay their mortgage. That, that wasn't their work. How are they going to find food to put in their mouths? And their problem was not because they were lazy. It was not because they didn't have good worth, work ethic. It was because they were dealing with circumstances that were beyond their control. Because they lived in a particularly dry climate. And so they were dependent upon the seasonal rains that came. And so if the rains didn't come, then they would have uh, nourishment for their crops so their crops could grow so that they could find the food that they need. And so they were dealing with things that were beyond their control. And so every day they would wake up being consumed and, and worried about how they're going to make ends meet just for that day. So that they could live. And it is interesting now. You know. Jesus with full understanding. A full knowledge. Of their predicament. He knows the struggle that they, many of them are facing. But here's what he says to them. He says I say to you. Do not worry about your life. Hmm? What you will eat. 
or what you will drink, nor your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? And many of us have a translation that says, take no thought. Do not worry. Do not be overly concerned about, about those things that you need for living. Do not be overly anxious. Do not be overly worried. And, and really the, what, he, what we're revealing here, what Jesus is trying to convey to us is this idea. He's pointing to us what really, what really worry is about. It is when we're concerned that something bad is going to happen if we do not have everything that we need. And so Jesus is aware of this predicament, and he understands, but he says, do not worry about that. And what is interesting is that in our culture, you know, from the time that we were born into this world, we were taught that you go to school to get an education, you get an education so that you can get a good career, so that you can get a good career, so that you can get a good job, so that you can get a good job so, or a stable job, so that you can get a paycheck. So you need a paycheck so that you can take care of yourself, right? And so our whole culture, our whole life has been, has been um, oriented towards this idea that we need to provide for ourselves, that we have to get everything that we need in order for us to feel secure. You know, earlier this week at prayer meeting, we talked about Abraham um, Maslow, a, a noted um, psychologist who, who uh, purported or proposed this idea of the hierarchy of needs. And, and what he suggests is that in order to really find security in life, in order to really find meaning and significance, he says that it begins fundamentally with having your basic needs met. Food, shelter, water, and a job. He's saying that unless you are able to fundamentally find security in these, in these things, then you will not have a life of fulfillment and meaning. But notice what Jesus is saying. He's actually saying the opposite of the wisdom of this world. He says, do not take any thought Oh, y'all not with me today. He says, don't even allow any of those concerns to even enter into your mind. Which is interesting, right? <laughs> and notice what he says. And he's trying to, and Jesus now, this is the famous Sermon on the Mount. And really he comes to totally, totally reorient the minds and the perspectives of the people. That's what the purpose of the word of the God is, is that we have become so uh, accustomed to the cultures of um, the, the values of our culture that we have uncritically adopted them and they shape and mold our lives and our expectations and our priorities. And Jesus is simply saying that these things are not a priority. Notice what he says. He says, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? In other words, there is more to life than food and clothing. And if you look in the next verses, he really begins to explain this. He really begins to, to, to unpack what he's trying to say. He gives an example. He says, look at the birds... Of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value of more value than they? And notice, think about this for a moment. You know, the, the birds, he says, they don't sow, they don't plant anything in the ground, hmm? they don't have a planting season, right? But not only do they not plant anything in the ground, but they do not go about, they don't, they don't have to worry about reaping. They do not harvest anything. They don't go around plucking the food out of the ground or the fruit off of the trees. Not only do they not plant anything, not only do they not gather anything, but, but they don't store anything up. They don't stockpile anything. They don't have a barn somewhere where they're storing all of their seeds. So that they would have enough to eat. They were not, they're not stockpiling things for a rainy day. <laughs> now, 
There's more to this series, and we're going to talk about some of those things. But let's, let's get fundamentally here at what Jesus is saying. They're not, so in other words, notice what he says. The word there, he says, look at the birds. And he's not just saying, look at the birds. He's saying, examine carefully. <laughs> examine carefully their life. And what he's saying is that, look at the bird. They're not worried about what they have to eat. They're carefree. Life for the bird is more than about finding something to eat. Because the Heavenly Father, he says, feeds them. Hmm? They're not preoccupied. They're not worried about those things because life for the bird is about more than even their fundamental needs. But notice what he says. He says, um, he says, he said, the birds of the air, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Later in John, Jesus says, are you not more value than many sparrows? And a sparrow in those times, or a bird, was worth literally in our currency one cent. So one, in order to have a, a, a sparrow, you have to pay one cent. If you wanted two, or if you wanted five, you would pay two cents. If you were to say many sparrows were 500, you would pay $2.50 for, spa- for, for 500 sparrows. If you wanted 1,000 sparrows in today's country, um, currency, you would only pay Um, five dollars and so what Jesus here is not he's saying you're not aren't you worth more than them which would suggest that we're not worth that much more Hmm? but I want us to understand that what Jesus is ultimately trying to convey here in this passage is that he's trying to show them that the birds don't have to worry about anything but the father is meticulously caring for the bird he is feeding them he's causing the tree to bud at just the right moment in order for the bird to satisfy its hunger he's causing the rain to fall so that it can nourish the ground and for the trees to grow all so that the bird can have something to eat when he it is totally God watching over the bird and like the songwriter says that if God is watching a sparrow surely he's watching over me but Jesus takes it even further he's not done he says in verse 27 which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature hmm one cubit literally is 18 inches, or that's like an arms from your elbow to the tip of your, your fingertips would be about 18 inches. So he says, which one of you, and there's a debate of, of is he talking about height? Which, which of you can add 18 inches to your height by just thinking about it, worrying about it excessively? Hmm? Which one of you sitting here today can just think so positively in your mind that you can, that you can add 18 inches to your stature, which really, think about it, this whole positive thinking reality or teaching that's out there. Jesus blows that right out of the water. He says that, and really what he's saying is that by worrying or thinking about it, no matter how much you think about it, worrying cannot change a single thing. Hmm? They also debate that it's not only just talking about height, but that he's talking about, that he's possibly talking about which one of you can add an extra day to your life by thinking about it. But whatever the case, Jesus is trying to show that none of us, none of us, by worrying, can change our situation. I love how he begins to even use another word picture. And he says in verse 28, another illustration from nature. And we learn so much from nature in Jesus' teaching. He says, so why do you worry about clothing? Now he's talking about clothing. And he says, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. In other words, think about it. You never see a lily or a rose or a flower straining trying to grow. 
You never see them twisting themselves. You, you don't hear anything, and of course they are playing, but you, there's no evidence that they're struggling trying to grow. No, they're growing because the life-giving power of God is causing them to grow. I can't help but think about the application for us in our spiritual walk and our spiritual experience. Many of us are trying to grow. We're straining to grow. We're not, but, but we can't do it. That's the work of God. Right? Amen. Right? But I want to go on. I want to go on. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the leaves of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And he says, I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. In other words, that Solomon in all of his splendor and all of his robes, that the lilies still are more beautiful than, than what the clothing that Solomon had. What God provides is even more beautiful. But then he goes on to say, but now if God so clothes the grass of the field which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? And I want you to think about this for a moment. Now, he's saying that the way that God clothes the grass of the field is with lilies. So he adds lilies and flowers. And that is the, the clothing of the field. That's how he beautifies the field. But he's saying something even more than that. He's saying that if he clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? In other words, grass was used as a fuel for the furnace. And so what Jesus is trying to say, that, that grass, if I take my time to clothe and sustain grass that you will use to burn so that you can make something else, if I take my time to clothe the grass of the field that is insignificant, how much more will I clothe you? And then he says that if you are worried about these things, O oh, you of little faith. Not that you don't have no faith. <laughs> but you got little faith. In other words, you have little confidence in God. Verse 31, therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? And it's a summary of what he's been saying. But in other words, Jesus is making the point again, and he's making this case that the pursuit of these things, again, is not a priority. He's saying, don't make these things uh, the, the basis for your security or your confidence in life. He says, don't, don't put your stock in these things. Don't, don't pursue them. They, they're ultimately not what really matters or what is most important. He said, it's not that important. And Jesus really showed that early in the book of Matthew, we talked about it last week, when he was tempted to turn the stones into the bread, Jesus said to him, he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And what Jesus there is showing and what he's further explaining here in Matthew 6 is that what matters most in this world is not what we have, but where our faith and confidence lies. He's saying that that is what matters the most. But he's saying something even more deeper than that. And I want us to think about our pursuit in light of how God views the existence of man. So I want to keep your hand there, Matthew. And I want to go to Psalms 103. Psalms 103. And I want to read verses 15 and 16. Psalms 103.
Notice what he says. As for man, his, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. 103, 15, and 16. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. Think about that for a moment. He's saying that our life is as fleeting as the lifespan of grass. Oh, you're not with me today. It is like, he says, that when we die, when we pass off the scene, it is like we were never there. That's how finite we are. Oh, you're not with me today. He's saying that all of the things that we can accomplish and amass in this world, it's just like grass. Oh, I'm messing with y'all today. Hmm? <laughs> he says, it's just, and you remember it no more. You rem it's like you were never here. Let's go a little bit further. Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40. We're going to come back to Psalms in a second. Isaiah 40. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 6. Isaiah chapter 40, and I want to read verses 6 through 8. And it's echoing the same thing, but it adds another dimension to it here that I, I think is important for us to, to hear. Isaiah chapter 40, notice what it says, starting in verse 6. The voice said, cry out, and he said, what shall I cry? Excuse me. All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. One mm -hmm. songwriter says, we're like a flower quickly fading. The grass withers and the flower fades because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The, and then he says, but the word of God, of our God, stands forever. Jesus is making the case that the pursuit of food and clothing and all that life has to offer in this world is by at best transient. Only for a moment. Just passing. Just passing. The things, they, these things that we are pursuing have no real value in the grand scheme of things. In other words, when you put the pursuit of these things in the world, and you measure it up with the sovereignty of God yes, sir. and who he is, yes. you will see that they do not matter. Hmm? Huh. Let's go. Psalms 90. I'm going to show you what Psalms 90. Who understood this better than most of us here today? Psalms 90. Than all of us. Than all of us. Myself included. Psalms 90. Psalms 90. And I just want to read a couple of verses here. Notice what he says. O Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Talking about God now. Before the mountains were brought forth. Or even you had formed the earth and the world. From everlasting to everlasting you are God. Does anybody know anything about Everlasting. In our human minds, we can't even comprehend what everlasting is. But he says, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Notice what he says in the rest of the verse, um, 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 verse 4. He says, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past and like a watch in the night. You know how long a watch in the night is? It's about three or four hours. He says, when yes, uh, after a thousand years, in the mind of Jesus, just to grasp it, it is like three or four hours that have just passed by. That's what a thousand years are we like. And when, Psalmist, when Moses is writing this prayer and he's thinking about who God is and who he is, 
He writes in verse 12, he says, someone, he says, so teach us to number our days, to make the most of our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Not more things. A heart of wisdom. When we think about who God is, just think about it for a moment. When we begin to see that we are like grass in comparison to God and all of our pursuits is a grass existence in the light of God. None of it matters. Not in the grand scheme of things. Let's go back to Matthew. Matthew, I'm almost done. Matthew 6. Matthew 6. Matthew 6 and verse 32. <laughs> Jesus knows how to preach, boy, I tell you. That's what he said. <laughs> he set him up real good. Then he comes to this. He says, for all these things the Gentiles seek. <laughs> huh? In other words, the people who do not know who I am, who are outside of the family of God, who don't know that I'm sovereign and I'm great and that I'm able to provide everything that they need, that I spoke a world into existence. He said the people that are preoccupied and worried about these things are unbelievers. These are people who don't know who I am. And he says, all these things they see continually, they are obsessed, they're continually going after, they're never satisfied, they got to get more. It always blows my mind that these millionaires, they have billions of dollars, but they're not satisfied. They want more and more and more. It consumes them because their security comes from having all of those things by being able to provide for all of their needs. Jesus says in verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now I want to understand something. Seek first, the word there, seek, it's a constant, it's a constant attitude. So like the unbelievers are constantly trying to get stuff, trying to make a name for themselves. He says, the person that knows me is constantly seeking after me. They're craving after me. They, they're like a deer panting after water. They are like the woman at the well that, had a, that was thirsty and couldn't find anything to satisfy the thirst inside of our heart. He's saying that that's the attitude of the people that know me. They're constantly seeking after me because they understand how finite they are. Seeking after him. But he says, seek ye first. And a lot of times we think that he's saying, well, seek me first on a list. So we make our list and just for good measure, we put Jesus at the top of the list. I'm on a closer walk with Jesus. Hmm? Jesus is saying, and really the word there, seek ye first, is seek above all. Seek only. Oh, y'all not with me today. He says, seek only my kingdom. In other words, seek the kingdom is me. Seek me only. Have an attitude. Make me your number one pursuit. Make me your all-consuming desire. I don't just want to be on the list. I am the list. All that stuff you're trying to get, all the, the hole in your heart, trying to find security. He says, I'm the list. Make 2017 about seeking me. Hmm? You know, I love, I love, I love how the writers put this together. If you go to, go to Matthew 20, 12, 20, 44, and really, again, it shows the perspective of things. What happens when we seek after the kingdom of God? Matthew 12, let's go there quickly. Matthew 12. Hmm. 
I wrote down the wrong passage here. Let me find myself here. The parable of the... Yes, 13, 44. I'm sorry. Matthew 13, verse 44. Let's go there. And he said, notice the parable. He says, and the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field. <laughs> oh, you're not with me today. Mm. Some of you get excited if you would win the lottery. He says, no, the kingdom is like a treasure. It's, like, it's better than winning the lottery. But notice the response when you find the kingdom. He, when the man find in the parable, which a man found and hid. And for the joy, he was so excited that he goes and sells all his possessions. Oh, you're not with me today. He gets so excited about Jesus that all of these things in the world, they don't matter. As a matter of fact, I'll get rid of it. If I got to get rid of it in order to have Jesus, then let it be. You can take it. Hmm? See, when you seek after Jesus, and I say this all the time, and I think about it, it's such a profound thought to me. When you seek God, if you're doubting his love for you, if you're doubting that he cares for you, if you seek him and get in his presence long enough, he will convince you of how much he loves you. If you're doubting God loves you, seek him with your whole heart. And I guarantee that he will let you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I love you. You're my son. You're my daughter. I'm smiling when I look at you. I'm excited when I see you. My heart skips a beat when you wake up in the morning because I know it's an opportunity to have a conversation to take care of you. It's my joy to take care of you. Hmm? <laughs> you know, I was thinking about it this morning. I was thinking about my kids. You know, and when, when, <laughs> when you have limited funds, <laughs> And I remember growing up as a little boy, it bothered me when I would go to the store and my parents couldn't, couldn't buy what I wanted. You know, you'd want it and it's like, they can, you, know, you know, we don't have any money for that. And so I thought about it this morning as I was getting ready to come to church. And I thought about how much that I never want to tell my children that we can't have that. Why? Because it would break my heart. Now, of course, we don't want to give them everything they want. But you want to know that you can provide for them. And I want to suggest to you that if we feel like that, hmm, how do you think God feels? He's offended when you're losing sleep because you're worried about how you're going to take care of yourself the next day. Huh? It breaks his heart. Because he makes it his business to take care of us. That's what God is about. He makes it his business. I'm going to read the other parable, the same parable again. He says it again another way in verse 45. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he fed found one pearl, he found one pearl that was better than any other pearl. It was so good, he stopped looking. Hmm? Huh? What would Tom Mitchell say? I searched all over, and I couldn't find nobody. Nobody like you. When he found the pearl, he did what? He went and sold everything. Oh, y'all not with me today. The joy of Jesus, when we see him, he becomes more than even things. As a matter of fact, we're willing to get rid of things. Let's go back to Matthew 6. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. I'm coming, I'm coming to the close here. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and the righteousness. I got to make that clear. So the kingdom of God is him, and, but it also seek ye first not only the presence of God, but he's talking about the rule of God in our hearts. Some of us just want a sentimental relationship with God. We just want him to save us. 
and forgive us and have mercy. But we don't want him to lead us and, and dictate what we do, where we go, what we say, who we hang out with, where we work, what we pursue. We don't want his rule in our hearts. But Jesus is saying that that's what me, what, that's what having me is all about. You have to seek not just my kingdom and all the blessings of my kingdom, but seek the rule, my rule in your heart. Yes, sir. And his righteousness. In other words, his character, his way, his will. It's not enough to say I believe in him and still be living the same way before you met him. And we're all in a growth continuum. We're never going to be perfect. But at least if you've been walking with him, walking with him for 15, 20 years, 10 years, 5 years, I guarantee if you're really walking with him, there's some things that you just don't do anymore. You just don't have the appetite for anymore. That's the, kind of, that's the kind of power that Jesus has had. Jesus has. He doesn't just save you, but he cleaned you up on the inside. Yes. And he's saying that a relationship with me is worth more than anything else. And the reason why Jesus brings this out is because he understands that a divided heart will always obscure our view of Jesus. Hmm? Whenever our hearts is, he's saying, Jesus is saying that the pursuit of these things, making them a priority, has a corrupting influence on the heart of the person. Notice what he says in verse 24 of Matthew chapter 6. Notice what he says. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one, disregard him, not have anything to do with him, or love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, that's the Aramaic word, for wealth and possessions. You can't pursue possessions and pursue God at the same time. They don't go together. Jesus says, make a choice. You just either pursue me and only me. Because if you pursue something in addition to me, I know the danger. I know it's going to cause you not to see me. And notice, really, you cannot serve God in man. Really what God is saying is that they're rivals. Mammon is a rival. It's a false god. It's a god of a, it's a little god, rivaling God for our hearts. That's how corrupting it is. I like what he says. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all these things shall be added unto you. Hmm? It's interesting. We love the all these things part, so we seek him. <laughs> but Jesus says how to pray. He says, pray that the Lord gives you your daily bread. <laughs> hmm? If we seek God for him, then it shapes our perspective on things. We're detached from him. Now, God, and I'm going to talk about in the sermon here in the future, about the purpose that God gives wealth or the means to do that, what the purpose is. But here we're seeing that he's saying that that's not important. I don't need that, and you don't need it either. I just want to say a couple of things. I'm coming. I'm, I promise you I'm trying to close. 6, verse 7 and 8. 6, verse 7 and 8. 6, verse 7 and 8. He says, and when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, 
for, for they think that they will be heard for many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you need before you ask Him. So when you start telling God what you want, because that's really most of the time what we're telling Him, is this is what I want. But when you start telling Him what you need, He already knows what you need. And while you're telling Him what He want, He knows what you need. And that's why sometimes we don't get an answer because in the prayer time, God is breaking and molding our hearts so that we will start desiring and wanting only what he wants. That's right. That's right. All these things have be added unto you. Don't, you don't need to pray long, eloquent prayers. You know, I'm about to ask God to bless me with this house. Lord, please let my credit clear so that I can get this apartment. You get down on your knees and you start praying a long prayer. He says, you don't need to pray no prayer like that because God already knows what you need. He's saying, don't worry about that stuff. Be consumed with me. That's why Paul says that when he comes, when he appears, I want to be found in him. That's what matters, to be found in him. This whole life is a preparation for the life to come. Jesus ain't trying to make you rich. He's trying to save your behind. That's why he died. And he might bless you along the way, but that's not his primary goal. 7 verse 11. 7 verse 11. Chapter 7 verse 11. He says, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? God has nothing but good intentions towards us. He's good even when you don't have the thing you think you need. He's still good. Sometimes he allows you to be in want so that you can know how much you really need him. Hmm? And sometimes the only way, God, the only way that he can get us to the place where he wants us, he's got to do a breaking work. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Hmm? He's got to break the outer man. Yes, sir. All these things shall be added unto you. Your heavenly father knows what you need. And finally, verse 34, he says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. In other words, simply, God is in control of the present. And he's in control of the future. Worrying about tomorrow. You can't do anything about it. But worry. He says, today has enough trouble. Just worry about abiding with me today. I got you. I've got the whole world in my hand. I know what the end of the story is. I've already laid out all of the days. I know what's coming tomorrow. Don't worry about tomorrow. Just trust me today. And I want to say to you today, my brothers and sisters, that when we make God our one and only priority, then we have the proper expectation and the proper pursuits, which is really just Him. Amen. All these other things will be added unto you. I want to close, share this at prayer meeting, beginning of the year. The top 11 New Year's resolutions. Number 11, top 11 New Year's resolution. Find a better job is number 11. Number 10 was find the love of my life. 
Number nine, do more good deeds. Number eight, learn something new on my own. Some noble things here. Number seven, work out on my own. I'm going to exercise on my own. I'm going to do it this year. Number six, spend time with my family and friends. Number five, do more exciting things. Number four, Quit smoking. Number three, make better financial decisions. Number two, self-improvement. And number one, anybody can guess what number one is? Lose weight. (laughs) Apparently, that's what everybody's thinking about. (laughs) All these gym memberships. Everybody's making a lot of money right now in the month of January. We'll all still be paying in June, and we're not going anymore. Amen. (laughs) What's interesting, I share that because it's so easy to make a list of things. But there's only one thing, only one thing that matters. Story of Mary and Martha. Jesus came to the house. Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus. Martha was cooking, and Martha gets mad. He says, oh, no, she's done the thing that's most important. And I'm paraphrasing now. She chooses the good part. What's most important, my brothers and sisters, my young people here today, we're getting ready to go to, some of you are getting ready to go to college, some of you are already in college. Do not buy into the lie. Do not make food and clothing and life in this world your priority. Make Jesus. Seek ye first. Seek only him. And all these things will be added onto you. This is what this is what this fast is about. It's to seek him so that he can shape our hearts and our minds. So that we can know him. So that we can be found in him so that we can be ready to meet him. And so today, I'm going to make an appeal, my first appeal, general appeal. For those of us here today who want to stand in recommitment to God and say, Lord, today, give me a desire to only seek after you. Notice I say, ask him to give us the desire. (laughs) For it is God who works in you to will and to do his good pleasure. You want to say, Lord, I've sought other things. I try to find security in other things and people and life in this world and what I can accumulate. But Lord, today I see I want to live life like the birds. Not thinking about, not worrying about where my next meal is going to come from. Lord, I want to come. I want to pursue. I just want you, God. Make me just want you. Lord, I just want you. Then my second appeal, my second appeal. For the person today that wants to give their heart to Jesus Christ. You've been worrying about things in your life, maybe things happening, finally. maybe your life is in chaos, or maybe it's not in chaos, but you know there's some things happening. You're not where, you're not where you are, where you need to be with God. And you want, you want him today. You just want him. You want him to come in your heart and clean you up on the inside and pour out his love, his love on you. You want to make him your priority. Are you here today? Are you here today? Mm, Holy Spirit, message of love to encourage me, lifting my heart from despair. How you loved me and cared for me, Lord.
speak to my heart. Speak to my heart. Are you here today? Anybody here today? Anybody wants to come today? Anybody wants to come and give their heart to him? can't hear from you then I know what to do I won't go alone I'll never go on my own your spirit guide let your word abide speak to your holy word if I can hear from you then I know what to do. I won't go alone. I'll never go on my own. Just let your spirit guide and let your word abide. Speak to my heart, Lord. Give me your holy word. If I can't hear from you, then I know what to do. I won't go alone, never go on my own, spirit guide, no word of life. out of eyes closed. Father, Lord, we're standing today asking you, oh God, to tear down every idol in our heart today. May we not place our confidence in our ability to provide. May we not allow these, our pursuits obscure our view of you. Forgive us, God, Lord, we often so easily get bent out of shape and think that it's up to us. But Lord, today we're standing because we want you and only you. And so we're asking today that you would create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit in us. Give us what we need, Lord, to pursue you. Give us a hunger for you. May we not be satisfied until we have you. Lord, help us to see that all that this life has to offer is nothing in comparison to you. So, Lord, may we find our security, our significance, our hope, our everything in you. And Lord, I pray for the person today who was worried about clothing and food and shelter. Lord, you say you know what we need before we ask. And you give good gifts. Lord, we're asking you to give them what they need. And while they wait on you, Lord, may they keep on trusting you. May they keep their hands in your, may we keep our hands in yours. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. God, from whom all blessings flow. 
And we want to thank God for this message on this day. Amen. We pray for the message. We pray that God would continue to bless and strengthen Pastor Reed. And we ask the Lord yes. to be with Amen. me yes. and you while we're absent one from another. You are dismissed.